Hey there, thanks for joining us for season two of The Dominant Ones, where we explore mastery and the pursuit of excellence through being dominant. Today's guest is Ben Mesrick, a New York Times bestselling author whose books have been turned into blockbuster films like 21 and The Social Network. If you want to know what it takes to be dominant as a writer and as a creative, then this is one you have got to listen to. Enjoy the show. You guys have not met, is that correct? Not in person. Okay. I wasn't on set of the day that you were in there um, this year uh, or last year, I guess. Did you write that episode? I wrote episode uh, three this year. So no, that was episode, That's... I think, four or five. I can't remember. That sounds about right. Um... It, it, it was fun. Um He's never going to win again if we ever do that again. We're not gonna, we're not, I'm not going to let him make a shot. So Ben, I have a question about that. You said so you didn't, you weren't the the the, the writer uh, per se on that episode, but it, in the room, in the writers' room on a show like Billions, do you all chip in? I, I mean, it, yeah. How does that so work? The, the bit, so I was a consulting producer for the whole season and a writer in one of the episodes, but the writers' room there is very much sort of. Um, involved in the whole season. It's a really phenomenal writer's room. And basically, you know, Brian and David, they have they have an idea, I think, or a plan. But in terms of putting the whole season together, we sat in a room for 12 weeks and you talk it through and you fill up sort of a whiteboard with episodes. And once the episodes are all full, then it, people break off and write the episodes. But, you know, as a team, yeah, the writer's room figures out the whole season and, and the map of every single episode along the way. Um, so yeah, you get to be really involved and, uh, and it was just a really cool experience all around. I, I, such a, I, I was a huge fan of this show previous to this and I had never met Brian or David. Um, and, but we had kind of circled each other because I did a book that turned into the movie 21 right. about blackjack in Vegas when around the time they did rounders. So I'd always known uh, them, but not really known them. And out of the blue, Brian asked if I would you know, join a writer's room. And I'd never written for TV. I'd never really, you know, worn pants to work. <laughs> I just stay at home and write. Um, but it was a great, great fun, fun season for me just to do that. So I was going to ask if you'd ever, I mean, you've written so many, I mean, so I've many written different a, types a, of things. a screenplay here or there. Um, you know, I've, I've, every now and then when I sell a book to Hollywood, they'll say, you know, you can take a shot at adapting it. So I've done stuff like that. But um, television had always eluded me. Um, you know, television exploded, became the most important thing. Um, but when I started writing, it was all big feature movies. Yeah. And then that shift, I never, so the reason I really wanted to work on Billions is I want to learn television because that's that's where all the great stories are being told right now. Um, so it was an, a great opportunity to learn from two masters of the craft, yeah. um, which was awesome, yeah. And so has it wet your appetite? Wetted? Well, you're you know, the writer, yes wetted no. or wet? I, I've definitely sold some TV since then. And, I, and my goal is to have a big series on the air. But in terms of like being a showrunner like those guys, I saw how much work they do. <laughs> so I don't, I, it's, it's intense. But I have to say the writing part of it, I genuinely love. I mean, writing for someone like you is, is something I would love to do again and again. It's just fun to see, because as a book writer, you don't get to see it come alive. And right. it's really fun to see words that you write come alive. And so I love that aspect of it. Um, so yeah, I intend to get into TV. I've sold, you know, I usually just sell a book um, and someone else adapts it. Um, right. But I think, you know, going forward, I'll probably do more of the writing. That's interesting. Yeah. So how, how did it all start for you as far as writing and, and knowing at that point, you know what, this is a career I want to pursue. When did that start for you? I mean, because, you know, we all go through ups and downs. And you go through trials and tribulation when you try to figure out what you're doing. This doesn't work and you try something else. When did you know that was this was, was your calling? Yeah, I was very fortunate in that I, I fell in love with writing very young. So I was about 12 years old when I decided mm -hmm. I wanted to be a writer. Previous to that, um, I love television. I love to watch TV. And my parents didn't like uh, us watching TV. So they made a rule that we had to read two books every week before we were allowed to watch TV. So I had become the speed reader, you know, when I was 10 or 11 years old, because my dad would make us basically. And so by the age of 12, I knew I want to be a writer, but I didn't know what kind of writer. I didn't know, you know, how one became a writer. Um, so it wasn't until right after college, uh, I basically locked myself up and I wrote and I wrote nine novels in a year, um, which I don't recommend to anybody. I sat in a room and I just wrote day and night, day and night. Um, and I couldn't sell them. I would send them out and get rejection, rejection, rejection. And I, Got about 190 rejection slips in, a, in that year after college. 
And it was insane. I mean, I just, I was rejected by everyone, but eventually I wrote one that was slightly better than the other ones. And I ended up selling my first book when I was about 23. So it started very early for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've essentially written a book every year since, but it, it was just a passion since I was a little kid. I just wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be like, you know, Jay McInerney, Brady Easton Ellis. I wanted to be one of, and then I wanted to be Michael Crichton, uh, you know, Jurassic Park. I wanted to write big movie books. Um, so for me, it was always this kind of, not just books. I wanted a project to be a Hollywood movie, a big book, whatever it could be. Um, and so I always saw myself in the entertainment industry rather than just being a literary writer. Do you think that's part of why you've written so many different types of books too? Yeah, I mean, I've always kind of moved with the, you know, I started in this a, a long time ago. Um, my first book came out in 1996. Mm -hmm. um, so really long time ago. Nobody read it, but <laughs> my first book came out. And I didn't have my major successful book, which was Bringing Down the House, which was moved into the made into the movie 21, until um, it came out in uh, 2002. So uh, then in 2002, I shifted into nonfiction, not because I wanted to, but because that book exploded. So I had been writing thrillers, like sci-fi, medical thrillers. I had like a TV movie back in, in uh, 99 or 2000. And then Bringing Down the House exploded and suddenly I became a journalist because that was the successful book. So I became a nonfiction writer for a number of books. And then the Facebook story kind of fell into my lap and, and changed my career again. So I shifted with the winds, you know? It wasn't like I set out, I'm gonna be a journalist because I never wanted to be a journalist or I'm gonna be you know, uh, whatever, uh, the Da Vinci Code, which is, you know, now I want to be write the Da Vinci Code, but I just wanted to write. I wanted to write books that were fun, exciting stories. And then I fell into things as, as, as I went along. Well, you know, that takes a lot of time and patience. Um, a lot of sacrifice <laughs> you have to make when you're writing on that level, because your imagination has to be free. You have to be in your own little quiet space and, and world that you can just, you know, be open and, and let yourself go. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, when it, it's almost like sports in a sense where you're in your own world and you feel like you're the best in that world. And uh, I'm kind of intrigued about writers a lot of times. Matter of fact, I even had a title if you ever want to do another book. It's called From No Light to Highlight, the Human Highlight Film Story. <laughs> but that's another day. Oh, really? <laughs> do you, do, are you really thinking about that? That's a. Uh... I am. I am. I am <laughs> oh, we're going to have to talk when we're done with this Zoom call. I got to say, I love any conversation that equates me with a professional athlete <laughs> because uh, for me, you know, I have never caught or hit a ball thrown in my general direction <laughs> in any way, shape or form. I was a horrible athlete, but I, I get what you're saying. And I do think that in terms of that, I've met professional athletes before and the intensity, um, the ability to, to work. And I sit in a room all day long, which is one form of intensity. What you guys do the practice level, the, the going out there and, and working yourself, it, it's similar in some respects. If you want to have success, right. you have to, you have to be obsessed. You have to also be delusional, at least for me to really believe you can be the best in the world at something. You have to delude yourself, even when everyone's telling you, you can't. And, 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 you know, when you start off as a writer, everyone around you is like, it, it doesn't happen. You know, no one makes a living at this. It's just, you're never going to make it. Acting I'm sure is the exact same way rejection, rejection, rejection. And you have to somehow believe that no matter how many people tell you, you can't do this, this is something you can actually do. And so I like to say it's, you're deluding yourself because the reality, the odds are infinitely small that you can actually succeed. But, but, anytime, you, you, but anytime you're trying to be successful with something, it's always, um, it, it's an opportunity, but it, it's, it's one in a million to get a chance to do what we do. You know, you might have a lot of people like you have a lot of what I call weekend wars that you got, you got guys to get out and play, but they're never going to be able to play on this level. But you can always dream. But when you can take those dreams and turn into reality, that's what makes it all worthwhile. And But it takes a lot of sacrifice, a lot of rejection, like in every form of competition, be it sports or acting or writing, it takes a, a, a tremendous amount of discipline. And you got to have some humility, too, as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. And you have to sort of figure out where you fit in that. And in terms of in writing, you know, you have to write what other people want to read. And that's a tricky thing to find that voice that other people are going to get as excited about as you get excited about it. And I speak to high schools a lot. And there's a lot of 
kids, um, you know, I talk to and, and I say, well, you have to decide, do you want to write for you or do you want to write for everyone? And those are kind of two different decisions. You can sit and write poetry or literature or something that really makes you feel good. And I think that's important to do. But if you want to have a career in this sort of field, it also has to be something that, you know, Hollywood's going to look at or that someone, you know, on their way to work is going to want to read. And so it's, it's interesting, you know, in this field, you have to you have to also figure out what voice you have and whether that's something that can translate to a big audience. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it's intense. But I've always been the kind of person who can just sit and write. You know, I when I started out, I would write 40 pages a day, which, again, is insane. Now I write uh, six to 10 pages every day. Um, and I just do it every day. And it's a, it's a, it's it, it's it's hard, but it's also just becomes ritual. And I think that's important. You have to really put yourself to it. Is that have you just that was my question. You you turned it into a ritual. Do you have uh, a time of day? Do you, is it exactly the same? Yeah, every my time? life shifted because, you know, I now have little kids and all right. that kind of thing. I used to be a nighttime person. So I would write from 11 p.m. to like five, six in the morning. Ooh. Now I actually shift it around. So I write from around noon until a normal hour, six or seven. And then I'll, if I'm on a deadline, I go back after dinner and write a couple more hours. Um, but I do have a very intense ritual. And I think the most important thing is I write by page and not by time. So when I'm working on a book, I need to write, let's say six pages a day. It can take an hour and I can be done with work in an hour, or it can take a day and it takes me a whole day to write those six pages, but I stop at those six pages. And I think that that's the key is rather than thinking about it in time, because if I say I'm going to write 10 hours a day, uh, you know, you might just sit there. Um, but if you say I'm going to write six pages, you, you work harder to get it done so you can get out of there. But, you know, every writer is right. different, but that's what works for me. Yeah. And on the flip side, you know, you could if you need those six pages, you could be there for 48 hours straight if it comes down to that. If it comes down to it, it depends on, you know, you know, yeah, what, what's going on um, yeah. in, in the career that I've sort of made for myself. What's great is I've never really the first time I ever had a boss was like Brian and David was working on billions because normally I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book. There's a deadline, but the deadlines move around for books. It's not that big a deal. Um, and so I just say, I have to write this book and, and it's up to me how, how that happens. Um, so it was a learning experience working in television where you basically, you're in a room every day at a specific time. Like, I, do you have to raise your hand and go to the bathroom? Like, I don't know how that stuff works. So I, I was a learning process and then having a really important deadline because there's a show going to be made was, was also a learning experience. But I chose writing in some respects because I'm not good with authority and, and I, I'm not good with being told where I have to be or when I have to be there. Um, and, you know, and I'm an insomniac. So the idea of having to get up in the morning was, was torture until I had kids and realized that, you know, you have to get up even earlier when you have kids, but um, speaking it, of torture, right, exactly. Early um, no, I don't know. I think I was made to be a writer. Um, it's all I've ever wanted to do. And so I was fortunate that I was able to find an audience. So as your career evolved, what was one of your biggest setbacks and what did you do to get through it to, you know, say, okay, this is a minor setback. This is what I need to do to get through it to get to the, to the next project or the next level. Yeah. I mean, I would say, uh, first of all, I always go back to that beginning phase when I was just getting rejection after rejection after rejection. And so I was basically, what happened was I graduated from college and I told my parents, I want to be a writer. And my dad, who is a doctor, and my mom, you know, is a lawyer, and uh, it, writing wasn't, you know, an option really. And so my dad said, I "I'm not going to let you starve. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you the bare subsistence, but you have to prove something in a year. There has to be some sort of forward motion in the end of the year." Um, so that's why I wrote nine novels in that year. I locked myself up and I wrote. And the rejection was, I guess, the first sort of. I mean, you know, I had the rejection letters stapled to the wall. So I looked like a serial killer. I was just surrounded by <laughs> um, And what's funny is everyone I've ever worked with since I have a rejection letter with somewhere. So every editor I've worked with had rejected me at one point, every publisher, I fed on it. You know, I fed on the rejection. I fed on the idea that everyone was telling me I couldn't get over that wall. And I think that to me was the way I got over that wall. It was not anger. It wasn't that kind of thing. It was more like, I have to prove everyone wrong. Um, and so I think that's what drove me, you know, over a writer's career is certainly, even once you succeed, you still get rejections. I mean, it's just the way it works. Not every project is a home run, um, but I've been pretty lucky in terms of the ones that I've really fell for have actually succeeded to some degree. But that was kind of the first real, you know, solid few years of my career was dealing with that level of rejection. 
But you know that 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 attitude, that dominant attitude, kind of got you through it. You know, you had all the rejections early, but it didn't slow you. It didn't stop you because it's just again that obstacle in the road that made you step back, look at your life, what you're doing a little bit more closely, and you find a way to get over it or around it. So it, it takes you know a strong attitude, a strong person to accept some of the rejections, but still able to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a it's a great theme. You know, the idea. Because I think that way, I, that whole dominance or I'm going to dominate. Because physically, I'm not a dominant individual, you know. And in high school, I certainly wasn't a dominant individual. I was the one in the locker, you know, hiding from the bigger people. And so as a writer, though, I do feel that's when I feel strongest. It's, it's the idea that I know I can do this. And I, somehow I knew that even before I was doing it. I felt this is what I was meant to do. And I, I did say, I'm going to dominate this industry. And, and it was a weird thing to say when you're 22 years old and, you know, you, you don't, you never sold or published anything. But I do think you have to have that level of, of confidence. It's, it's very hard to make it in these careers if, mm -hmm. if you don't believe no one else is going to believe. And that's definitely yeah. true um, for writers. If, if you're not 100%. Um, and I, when I speak to younger people, I say, you really have to decide that this is what you want to do. And you don't have to decide right now, but if you're going to pursue a career in these in the arts, for instance, you have to know because it's so hard. It, there's so yeah. many people who are going to be lining up, uh, you know, to beat you down <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Um, and everyone around you is going to be doing other things and making livings and whatever it is they're doing while you're, you know, I came out of, I came out of college right in when wall street was exploding and everyone I came out of college with, were making fortunes when I was sitting in a room writing. And you you feel that you're like, I could just go get a job. I was in a, yeah. a privileged position in that, but I knew this is what I wanted to do. Um, and so, yeah, it's tough. You have to really, really delusionally believe that this is what you were meant to do. Delusional, it comes back to that. We yeah. use that, I use that term too. And we used it on an, another interview with somebody. Um, but it's almost like we could call it, it it's fascinating because you're tying the idea of your definition of dominance um, to defiance as well, an almost blind defiance. Yeah. And so we could be the defiant ones, although that was taken. Lovely movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I just I, um, I, I, I also find it interesting because <clears throat> we are all three in industries where you need that delusional belief that you can make it. That, that semi-delusional belief um, until it's proven otherwise. But um, at this, because there's no way you will make it without. Right. It can also lead a lot of people mm -hmm. into truly de delusional behavior where they won't make it. And it's always, that is the, that is the death defying little balance that we take in entering these fields. Because if you want to make it, you got to believe you can make it. You've got to commit so much of your life to it that by the time you decide you're not going to, if it doesn't work, then it puts you behind the eight ball and a number of things. And I think that's what makes our parents terrified. Um, you know, that I, I can't believe you want to be an actor. You want to be a writer. You want to be in the NBA. Wait, what? Um, I, I do think that, that that duality has always surprised me. And I'm wondering yeah, I mean, actually think, for both of you guys, how you dealt with that. Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I, you know, it was a time limit for me. And, and I think, I think people should, put a time limit on on a dream a little bit because there there is reality and you have to you're going to sacrifice a lot like you were saying you're going to give up a lot to try and make it in this career so don't say i'm going to spend the next 25 years shooting yeah. for this because then you're kind of could be left in a very bad place you're going to say i'm going to give five years to this and if i don't find some forward motion in those five years um then i'm going to do it on the side you know then i'm going to be one of those people who you know writes, but maybe not for a living. And I understand that's going to be giving up something. But the reality was, if I didn't show some sort of forward motion, my goal was I would become something else, a professor or whatever it was. Although I had a second issue, which is that I went massively into debt, so I had to do something that made a lot of money either way. Um, so I actually put myself in a position where I didn't have a choice but to succeed, um, which I highly don't recommend to anybody. Yeah, you, you, boy, you're so right. You know, you know, because I when I came up, you know, I knew early on, again at age 12, that hmm. I was going to be an NBA player. I, I just knew it at age yeah. 12. But it is a time limit on how you get there because it takes a lot of hard work in the beginning. You got to be willing to put in the work. But then once you get amongst your peers, 
it doesn't, it's not 20, 15, 20 years down the road. You're talking like three or four years, maybe five years down the road where yeah. you have to have some sort of plan in place and you have to have that body of work behind you to hopefully propel you to that next level. Because like you said, you have to be a little delusional, but it's a lot of time that delusion can push you, you know, the other way where hey. you don't give yourself an opportunity to make it. And I've seen a lot of guys do that. Oh, I've seen yeah. a lot of women who, who did that. So again, yeah. you got to be for you, to there step out to be faith. The level of confidence or the level of, of delusion, I guess, the word to walk onto a court with someone, you know, who you've played against like Larry Bird or, or Michael mm -hmm. Jordan. Most people would fall apart <laughs> just because you know what you're standing up against, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. to be able to dominate in those situations, it, it has to take something else, you know? I, I tell you something. I when I competed against guys like that, I was always nervous before a game. I mean, even, I, it could be the weakest guy or the strongest guy. I was always nervous before I competed, but I never had fear of mm -hmm. anyone. I never feared anyone I've ever played against because if they saw that fear, they had you. So I couldn't let them see that fear because I always believe. I got to make you worry about me as much as I'm going to worry about you. <laughs> you no, know? and that's the way all of us looked at it. That's the reason why we got to a level of excellence. It's because of that attitude, that dominant. You know, I believe I'm the best. You know, at what I do. And mm -hmm. believe me, Larry Bird was something else. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> he was something. I know he'd say the same about you too. You know, yeah. uh, and you. It, that's interesting because I've I've heard you talk about how you used. Uh, well, first of all, I'm curious if you if you literally if you legitimately like got rid of fear for yourself or if you trained yourself not to show it or trained your mind to turn it off. I'm curious about that. And then also just you talked about the dunk as an instrument of intimidation so that you yeah. that was like you, you see one Dominique Wilkins dunk and you're terrified he's going to put you he's going to put you on a poster next time. What, what, what the thing is, I used to tell guys all the time, I said, when you see highlights of me, what do you see? You see slam dunks, the high wire acts and all that stuff. I said, but it's very difficult to score over 26,000 points on dunks. <laughs> I've had games where I had 40 plus points and had one dunk in the game. That, but it was that one dunk that I used for a tool for intimidation to back the big guys up so they wouldn't challenge my shot half the time. Right. But it was an attitude. It was a, a confidence level that I believed in. You know, and it carried from the age I was 12 to present day. I've had that same attitude. I competed everything through. My son, for example, he's never beat me. <laughs> when he gets to the point he beats me, either I'm too old or, you know, he's gotten too good. But right now I'm going to enjoy beating the hell out of him. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> <laughs> That's, <awesome. laughs> That's great. That's great. Um Ben, I'm curious about, because it sounds like you've had such, uh, like uh, you're very disciplined. Did that come easy to you, being able to do that? that or did, did it, was it like pulling teeth at first and it became second nature? Yeah, no, so I, yeah, it's great. So in my regular life, I'm not disciplined. I'm, I'm lazy. You know, I could watch TV literally for five straight days without getting off of the couch. That's normal. But in terms of my writing world, I think I play a little bit with my quirks and my OCDs and things like that mm -hmm. to create sort of rituals around writing. And so I'm actually very capable of sitting in a room for 10 hours alone because I have ritual ways of, of, of setting it up. And, and for one, you know, I used to actually play backgammon against myself and I'd have a backgammon board and play 20 minutes of backgammon against myself to get into that mode. And there's like music playing. There's all these weird rituals I put into it. And in terms of my writing, I'm very capable of being disciplined and nothing else in my life am I. Um, but half of my life as a writer is research um, because I like to go and become a part of the story. So to write, you know, bringing down the house, I joined the MIT blackjack team and spent six months going to Vegas every weekend to play blackjack yeah. with card counters. To write the Facebook story, I followed Sean Parker around. I followed Eduardo around. I became as much a sort of a fly on the wall. My recent book was about the, uh, the Winklevoss twins. It was called Bitcoin Billionaires. And I shadowed the Winklevi for a year. Um, and so that part of my career is very different than my writing. So in my writing life, I'm this OCD-ish sit in a room and stare at a computer for 10 hours. But then I, the other half of my year is spent you know, being chased by the Yakuza in Tokyo or whatever. I wrote a book where I, I've done some really crazy things where I followed this alien hunter around 
the hills of Colorado looking for aliens. And, and so I've had sort of two phases in the way I write things. Um, so yeah, I can be very disciplined, but um, only in terms of just writing. The rest of my life is, is not at all like that. Yeah. I had a follow-up question all set up and then I was like, wait, you talked yeah, about aliens. And directions. So I've written 21 <laughs> books at this point and, and uh, I even forget some of them, but I've written some really wild stories. I wrote a Russian oligarch story. I don't know if you read uh, Once Upon a Time in Russia where I, I was hanging out with some really scary dudes um, or the, you know, any one of these stories we could talk about. But over the years, I've, I've always wanted the book, the next book to be about something completely different. So I've fallen into very different worlds over and over again um, to write it. You, you said um, you were talking. That's interesting because you talked. You said that the um, social network, just the Facebook story, just sort of fell into your lap. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like you present yourself as a target. Like yeah. you, you. It's like, uh, and it's interesting. Um, I think in acting and basketball, it's probably sort of similar. Um, if you're playing the game well, you are presenting yourself at all times. Uh, and you're you're uh, you're you're available to the input. You're available to the pass. You're available to the to the, what the other actor is giving you. But in your case, it sounds like you you, especially because you wrote so many different types of things, you made yourself available for someone who had this story. To I mean, I'm, I'm I, yeah. tell me about that because that sounds that sounds like it makes perfect sense with the yeah. Word and then by the way, after this, I want to ask you a question about because I'm actually fairly fascinated by fame and and the idea because as a writer you're usually the fly on the wall. You're not the picture on the wall. Um, and the key to being a writer in a lot of ways is to somehow be there without being intrusive or changing the story. Um, and so for me, uh, the social network is, is an example of where I, I fell into a story where literally, I, after Bringing Down the House came out in 21, it was this big movie among college kids. I became the guy that everyone sent stories to. I had a presence on, on online, not a huge one, but people who knew how to find a website could find my website. And I started to get phone calls and emails just of people pitching stories to me about what they'd done. Most of them were from prison or whatever, but every now and then there was like a great story. And, and so many of my books have come just that way over the transom, a random tweet or a random email. The Facebook story was a two in the morning email from a Harvard senior he said, my best friend founded Facebook and no one's ever heard of him. And it was not Zuckerberg, it was the other guy. Uh -huh. And I went out for a drink and in walks this Eduardo and he just starts the story by telling me how Mark Zuckerberg had screwed him over. And I spent six months with these guys. And, and so a lot of my books have happened that way. Some random person shoots a story at me or, or throws something my way and I dive in. And I spend some time figuring out whether it's gonna be big enough, whether it could be a movie. I'll never write a book if I don't think it can be a movie. And in fact, for almost all 20 of my books, I've sold the movie rights before I've sold the book. I write a proposal, I sell it in Hollywood, and then I, it doesn't always get made, but I sell the movie or a television show, and then I write the book, and then, and then we can be developing that other project at the same time. And so all the way back to you know 20 books now, I've done that, um, which has been a wow. phenomenal way to do this and, and yeah. that, you know, it's, it, it only worked because 21 was such a big hit and then the social network was such a big hit that I had a lot of people in Hollywood who would, who would buy my stuff, but it's a good way to do it because you know your stories are big enough um, in that way. So, so Kelly and, and I want to know with one of these last questions we have to ask you and, you know, everybody answered a little different, have a belief how they, you know, uh, answer this question. So what makes you dominant at this point in your life? Yeah. Oh, that's a, it's a great, it's a good question. And uh, I think um, what it's a, it's a hard to answer question in, in a simple way. I think earlier in my career, I would have said the fact I could sit in a room and write something and I feel so confident about that, that I feel like I'm, I'm dominating a, a world. You know, I, I create a world, I control that world, that story that I write, that book that I write, it's mine and I can make it go in any direction I want. And I've always been able to find a way to tell a story. And I think that that's part of it. But I think now in my life, it's strange. Um, and maybe it's getting older, maybe it's having kids, um, but I feel more in control, which is strange in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> right? Than I've ever felt. Um, I grew up an anxiety ridden, hypochondriac, every kind of neurotic issue you want to throw at someone, I probably had at some point. Um, and it took a long time to get to a point 
where I feel much more relaxed and confident about sort of my place in, in, in what I do. Um, which isn't to say I, I, I couldn't go broke tomorrow. <laughs> the book industry is not a great industry. Who knows what's going on with movies? You know, it could change tomorrow. But I do finally feel like I'm in a place where I know what I want to do and I know how to do it. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's been a pretty wild thing. But, you know, it's 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 different sort of every day. But I feel that I am now dominant in my life in a way. I, I've, I've reached that level where I, I like what's going on and I just want to keep it going in this direction. <laughs> Does that make sense? Wow, great. Oh, it makes sense. Well, yeah. Hey, well, you know, we, we really appreciate you coming on the yeah. show and talk to us about your life and open up, tell us about some of your personal things in your life. So it's great. So, you know, I'm looking at this now and say, you know what, we can do a dominant project or a dominant book, you know, I'm throwing I, it out I there. I love the idea. I'm a big fan and, and it would be <laughs> from, so cool. And I from, think what, have, from no light to highlight. I, I know you have a great story to tell and uh, it's awesome. And I want to say, Kelly, what a, an, an honor to write for you this, this, you know, season or being a part of, of this. I am such a huge fan of, of what has happened with Billion. Thank you so much for coming thank on, you, my guys, friend. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you for watching The Dominant Ones. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons to know when we release our next episodes. And please let us know in the comments what makes you dominant.